I'm Mary Ann Lewis. I'm the dean here at the Lindner College of Business. And I am so happy to welcome you and see you all here and very pleased to introduce, in just a moment, our special guests. Um, I think before I do that, I would like to do a little bit of scene setting, stage setting, as you might say. Because really, this story begins with UC's vision for Next Lives Here and the emphasis on really elevating this university through a sharpened and shared collective focus on innovation, inclusion, and impact. And I can't say enough how important that is to us here at Lindner, but also across this campus, that we're dedicated to that vision. And maybe an example that's particularly fitting today is our work with the UC Entrepreneurship Center. Um, we're in fact elevating that center now to an interdisciplinary institute because there is so much going on in this campus, in this ecosystem, in 1819, the Innovation Corridor and far beyond. And it's about becoming a hub and connecting those dots in more powerful ways so that we can support and disrupt. And all of you are tremendous examples of this. I mean, this doesn't happen without powerful partnerships. I'm sure we might hear about the, the real power behind Key Startups is a great starting team. And at UC, a big part of that is across colleges. And so, as one example, I know we've got a lot of engineers here. I mean, the work we do with CES, our engineering partners, is so vital, as are medicine and DAP and everybody else. But just so um, the president and Jim know who's in this audience, we've got a lot of students from across Lindner and and at CEAS, but also other places, but leaders of our entrepreneurship club, across different programs, co-ops, co other work that you're doing as you're trying to explore your own futures in innovation, venture capital, startups. And we could not have better guests today to help you do fuel some of that exploration that you're working on. So let me have share with you some brief introductions. First, we've got Jim Getz. Um, Jim is an entrepreneur, an investor, an engineer, and a bear cat. And more so, he's not, which we obviously think is exciting, he's a partner at um, Sequoia Capital, which is renowned on so many fronts, but really fueling some of the landmark technology companies globally. I mean, early on, they were working, and specifically Jim, with early Apple, Google, PayPal, and if you look more recently at the disruptors that they've been fostering, you see Airbnb, Instagram, Zoom. I mean, there's such a list, but I want you to think about the vision it takes to pick out diamonds in, a, in the rough in a really crowded, growing field, and one that's shaping so much of the world that we live and work in. Likewise, if you, you look at, Forbes has something called the Midas list, and I just have to note, I mean, it's been a w well more than 10 years running that Jim has been on their top 10 often, and I mean often, number one, for the most important venture capitalist globally. So we really have an opportunity here to learn. And I think we add that to the vision that is our President Pinto, by the way, also an engineer by trade, um, by training, and an award-winning scholar, teacher, and the visionary behind Next Lives Here. So I think we have a beautiful opportunity. The format today is going to be informal in that we're going to start with a fireside chat between these two visionaries and then open it up with some help from Kate Harmon, who leads our UC Center for Entrepreneurship, and give you a chance to ask some questions. So please, be thinking. Obviously, it will depend on timing. But in the meantime, let's give a big round of applause and thanks to our visionaries. Thank you, honored to be here. Thank you, Mary Ann, appreciate it. Uh, and certainly, thank you for making this opportunity and hosting us in your college. I hope it didn't take uh, too much, uh, it didn't cause too much of a disruption, and I know you're busy with classes, and I believe- It was certainly a, a hurry up offense. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So 2.15, I think, is the time we have to be out of here, right? So, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, wonderful to see so many students. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Jim for making time to do this today. We have a, a series of events for him uh, today. But to me, uh, as a professor for, first. For, for Dr. Manti, thank you. For Dr. Manti, yes. But you're going to be attending them uh, and you're going to play an important role. So the reference to Dr. Manti is, is Dr. Manti here? I don't think he's here. He wasn't expected to be here today. But 
So the connection, and I was, uh, you know, I want you to connect with Jim where his origins and how he got to where he is today. And it won't be a long story, Jim. I know you don't like me to talk a lot about you. But he started in Cleveland, Ohio. Came to the University of Cincinnati in 1984. And I think you described yourself uh, as, uh, let, me, let me get it right, scattered and an ill-prepared freshman. That would I think, be kind. <laughs> but I'll also say that's sort of the vast majority than I was a freshman. But uh, this university made a difference to him. And in particular, one teacher, one professor here made all the difference. And the reason I mention that is because you are students today. Your story right now is probably not very different from his. And you can see the possibilities here. And this connects really to me in a profound way. This of the four events we have for Dr. Manti, this connects most profoundly because here we're focused on learning. And that's what universities are about. And no better than a practitioner who has a similar origin story to yours coming back and you learning from him. So thank you, Jim, for making the time. I know you're, you were very busy today, but thanks for adding this on, and this was it's going to be a pleasure. So let me start, actually, with the first question. Tell us a little bit, and the more anecdotes, the better, a little bit about your recollections of your time at UC and how that impacted your life and your professional success. So maybe I'll go back to high school. Um, Tony Zingali, who's sitting in the front row in purple and pink, and I both grew up in Cleveland. Um, I had excellent test scores, but I had mastermind a 3.3 GPA. I don't think I'd get into UC today. The most impressive part of my high school record was the number of suspensions and arrests during my adolescence. Extra credit for anybody that can identify that aggregate number. It's in double digits. But I entered the university broke, just enough money to pay for the fall quarter, and <clears throat> scattered, uh, intimidated, because I was in a program where everybody I met, I felt like was valedictorian or salutatorian. But I had a plan, and the plan was pretty simple. I was going to bury myself in a library, and I was going to get after it. My experience here was largely shaped by an incredible teaching community that were focused on the undergraduates and a co-op program out of Digital Equipment Corporation in Boston where I was working with some of the best and brightest minds in engineering. At that point in time, DEC was the leading computer company on the planet. And those two experiences are rare, exceptional, and were transformative for me during my time here. Okay. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, so this, as uh, Dean Lewis said, you know, we're going to focus a lot of this on entrepreneurship, so I'll get right to it. And often when we talk about entrepreneurship, we may not all be thinking the same thing when we think about who, why, what, and how. And so I'll start with uh, a relatively elementary question uh, for you. Why is entrepreneurship so important to society? Look, it's part of the American dream. It's, it's all about transforming your lives, your family lives, and, and being able to economically shift your family and your position from what might be a middle class um, set of challenges. And I think just the dream itself and the notion that here in America that possibility exists is a big part of what drives thousands of immigrants to come to Silicon Valley every month. Mm -hmm. And I think when I spend time talking about immigrants and entrepreneurship, they're often the North Star for me when I think about how lucky we are to have a culture and a social ecosystem and an economy that embraces entrepreneurship. Working for the man for 30, 40 years, or the woman, gets a little old. Mm -hmm. Good reason. <laughs> and, and how does one get started? What is venture capital? 
I mean, how is that important uh, to an entrepreneur? Well, there's two questions in that. How do I get started as an entrepreneur um, and, and then venture capital? So I, I think on the entrepreneurship front, I think the decisions you make early in your career to find an apprentice role to expose you to company creation, market entry, product market fit, to understand what an elite product team looks like, to appreciate low friction, simplicity, and how business models can be used as a weapon. Getting yourself in an ecosystem for two, three years where you're working directly for a founder or part of an early stage team is the best way to prepare yourself to start a company. And you know we do a great job here at the business school, but I think there's nothing like being part of a company for a few years to prepare you. Okay, terrific. And venture capital, how does that play into it? Well, look, venture capital has been around for almost 50 years. Um, it's risk capital. And you know, at one point in time, it was a small cottage industry. And I know you grew up in Palo Alto. There's a road there called Sand Hill, where today there are about 400 firms. It's no longer a cottage industry. It's a large portion of the financial services industry at this point in time. But venture capital is all about identifying the next wave of disruptions and changes that are fueled by underlying changes in tech. Literally on a 10, 15 year basis, we see these waves of destruction that occur across the entire ecosystem. And a new wave of category leaders are created. And venture capital's challenging role where you're attempting to identify the next wave of market leaders. And we often get it wrong. It's a humbling business. And despite what most of you might think, we don't worry about losing capital when we back an entrepreneur. We're, we're actually happy to see our capital evaporate. What haunts us is the companies that march through our doors that we pass on that become the next Salesforce or Facebook. And that keeps us humble because it happens every few months. Okay. So, um, you know, I hope there are many budding entrepreneurs here. I expect there are. And the origin stories of entrepreneurs are always extremely interesting. I mean, I could start up with you asking you about your origin story, but I know you don't like to talk about that as much. Let's sort of dip into your experiences, try to get a perspective from that. From You've had 25 successful years as an entrepreneur and investor at Sequoia. And uh, you've probably come across some budding entrepreneurs, and uh, you have stories about them. And some that I think would be incredibly important for these budding entrepreneurs to learn about the struggles and uh, the, that, that they had early on and the anxieties and the insecurities. So could you get a, give us one, and maybe you could start with one that you backed a long time ago, Palo Alto Networks, perhaps, as, as an example. Uh, Palo Alto Networks, uh, near Zook. Near, uh, as a teenager, broke into the Israeli Defense Ministry and broke into the Mossad's computer systems. He was quickly imprisoned. And his punishment uh, had him working for an individual named Gil, who, when he understood near his talents as a hacker and a coder, he went off and started a company called Checkpoint. Uh, near Zook was a gifted entrepreneur later in life, but at that point in time, he was an incredible coder. And <clears throat> Checkpoint rose to be a public company and created the firewall category. Near thought he was a co-founder or certainly part of the founding team. And it wasn't until the company went public that he realized he had a fraction of the equity he thought he had. Um, near left with a massive chip on his shoulder. When I met him for the first time in Palo Alto, 
He was driving a BMW with license plates CHKP, the symbol for checkpoint on NASDAQ, KLR, killer. I thought to myself, okay, he, he might have some emotional issues. <laughs> we incubated Nier with a small seed investment, $250,000. And I knew he needed a co-founder that could balance out his bombastic emotional approach and just where he was in his life. And I introduced him to my co-founder at Vital Signs, Rajiv Batra, who was a IIT grad, had built large engineering organizations, and the two of them spent roughly six months in our office. Um, Ashim Chanda at Greylock and I both co-led the A, and we teamed with the two of them to surround them with talent, especially outside of cybersecurity and coding. They needed help thinking through market entry, how they're gonna create unfair advantage, and today, Nir and Rashid are still with the company. It's been 14 years, I think 2006 we funded the company. Um, their market cap probably sits at 40, 45 billion dollars, and although I'm still on the board and I don't want people to consider this MNPI, I'm pretty confident it'll be a 100, 200 billion dollar company in the coming years. Cybersecurity has become, in my opinion, the biggest threat to the nation state going forward. And the skill set that Nier pioneered some 20 years ago is now democratized across not just China and Russia and North Korea. There are 50 countries that have hired former NSA, former 8200 personnel, and they are weaponizing their nation state for all kinds of economic and political reasons and I think the energy around cybersecurity is going to go up in order of magnitude in the next decade. So you see that as a, an opportunity, an area in which- No question. Uh, okay. All right, and how would you guide someone who wants to you know, start to think about that? So thinking about someone now who's a student here, but uh, eager to make a difference through entrepreneurship. Uh, what guidance would you have for that person with respect to what they should be thinking about in terms of qualities that they should build out? Uh, I would assume resilience is very important. Uh, uh, a focus is very important. But if you could speak a little bit more about uh, your perspective from all you've learned. Sure. I, I think there's a, there's a couple things in cybersecurity. First, there's, there's always a new class of threats. And there, there's typically a wave of young companies that pursue an approach to address those threats. And that ecosystem continues to create lots of interesting companies. And so I think getting yourself into a cybersecurity company, understanding the methodology, but then maybe looking for a unique opportunity or a niche, because most of what we back early on is not a large market. I wouldn't recommend entering the firewall market at the moment. But there are lots of opportunities that are small in terms of market size today that are going to be large in a decade. And I think that creates a set of market conditions that are quite lucrative. And, and my guess is cybersecurity for the last decade has produced one of the highest batting averages in terms of sectors, where the number of companies that have been funded it's probably close to 70% have succeeded in some way. Modest acquisition, meaningful acquisition, or public offering. And so if you're looking for safety, cybersecurity might be one of the best categories. But what, what about that next opportunity around the corner? What is your advice to folks to have that ability to see around the corner for the one that's not clear at this point, cybersecurity appears to be one that has a lot of attention, but are there, would, would you advise from your experiences about how they should be thinking about, I guess, informing themselves and creating that, uh, that knowledge base that uh, allows them to anticipate the next big thing? I guess the comment I'd make is that it's, it's rarely the obvious idea, because if it's obvious, there's a dozen teams pursuing it. It's an insight that might come from domain expertise. It might sound quite small when you start. I mean, Apple was hobbyist computing in a garage 
Google was all about trying to improve search. And it was not viewed as a consumer technology when they created Backrub on the Stanford campus. And so I think niche opportunities that probably won't give you cred when you're talking in your entrepreneurship group are some of the most interesting scenarios for you to embrace and engage. And I'd say about a third of our entrepreneurs that we back have some personal pain that they're trying to solve. And they're building a product or a business to solve that for themselves. Always a great motivator you know, and great passion. With this comes failure. With this comes risk. How have you managed failure in the past? If you've had any, I'm not sure you've had any, but if you've had failures, how have you managed them? How have you calculated risk? Well, there's, there's two elements to that. As an entrepreneur, you know, I, I want to encourage everybody here to take risk and to embrace failure. We love backing an entrepreneur that had failed in the last couple of years. In fact, our biggest fear is backing an entrepreneur after he's come off of a big exit. Our hit rate with those individuals is disappointing. It's the chip on the shoulder and it's the learnings that come from failure that often put you in a position to succeed. Omar Hamoy from AdMob failed twice. Couldn't get any attention on Sand Hill Road. And uh, we backed him in his third company, AdMob, that was eventually the pioneer in mobile advertising. When you see an ad on your phone or an Instagram, it's their technology pioneering that. And so I, I, I think as an entrepreneur, it's, just, it's part of what you have to accept when you take the plunge. And at the same time, the kind of baggage that comes in other societies around entrepreneurship and failure, we don't have here in the States. And it's certainly not going to impact your ability to fundraise in the future. As a investor, I, I think there's a set of non-obvious issues that occur in the venture community. The first is that ambition and intelligence are not the reason you'll fail. It's your psychological makeup. Because in our business, you plant a half dozen, dozen seeds in your first four or five years. Your winners aren't obvious. You've known success most of your career, and the lemons start falling from the tree. You have three or four companies do what we call an ABC. Tony, what's an ABC? Assignment for betterment of creditors. It's basically a bankruptcy. And that very humbling dynamic for a young, ambitious investor often has them looking to hit singles rather than to go after home runs. Part of the challenge in our business is that you have to power through years three and four and five before you actually begin to see what might be a public company or a large M&A exit. And our biggest challenge at developing people at Sequoia is not ambition, work ethic, intelligence. It's getting them through that psychological period and having them recognize we don't care about losing money. We care about passing on the next sales force. And psychologically, I think all of the senior partners at Sequoia had gone through a dark period where we questioned whether we were going to continue in the business. And it's our mentors and the folks that have been around for a while that have helped us create a culture to encourage people to support one another. And it's embodied in the way we make decisions. We have a voting structure that's a single veto. And you might think, wow, you guys are probably shutting down lots of deals. Just one person can turn it down, one general partner. It turns out that when somebody says no, there's a dynamic in the room where everybody else is good. I'm at least a maybe. I don't need to be the no. If there were two no's required, there'd be some safety in numbers. And our business is about taking risk and avoiding passing on a great company. And some of our best outcomes, you'd be embarrassed to hear the initial presentation. 
I mean, Airbnb was air bed and breakfast. It was a bunch of college kids renting mattresses for a convention. Some of our senior partners that were emeritus thought we were absolutely crazy. And so the challenge in the investment business is counterintuitive, but it's to embrace risk and accept that you're in a role where you're going to see lots of failure and you just have to get comfortable with it. Thank you. So you've given us some insight into how Sequoia works and how it makes its decisions and selections. Uh, but specifically, what do you look for in a founder of a company or founders of a company? What, are you look, what type of characteristics are you looking for? Well, first of all, they're, they're often unknowns mm-hmm. and underdogs. Many are immigrants. Domain expertise, passion, magnet qualities, an ability to recruit exceptional talent, a sense of culture and values that will attract Mm -hmm. and put you in a position to grow the company are all critical elements. But the real test when we meet with them is can they characterize a unique and compelling value proposition and create clarity of vision around the company that they hope to create. And that haunts most of the best and brightest and the amount of energy that needs to go into preparing to articulate your value proposition and what's unique and compelling, especially for engineers, isn't fully appreciated until they go out and attempt to raise capital a few times. And then you learn that marketing's actually something that I might want to pay attention to. Okay. Are there other mistakes that founders make, uh, things that they can avoid, things that you can advise our students on? Well, the, the most common mistake is just market timing. You know, is the market condition uh, ripe for disruption? And I think a lot of people go too late. Our best entrepreneurs are there before anybody else, before there's no market. I mean, many companies, Figma being an example, if you're in the design space, they were seven, eight years without any revenue. It was kind of a happening. It'll be an important IPO sometime next year. But there's a lot of hard work in establishing a category leading company. But if you can put yourself in a position where you've defined a category early for anybody else, the learning curve from your early customers and the iterations on the product puts you in a position to be the dominant market leader. And in our experience, if it's a brand new market, it's typically winner take all, winner take most. There'll be one company that dominates the market cap and the revenue for that category. It's also led to you know, some of the issues in society around inequality, which we should probably talk about at some point in time. But I, I, I think category design and recognizing that you're not gonna receive a lot of texts and phone calls and inbound from the press your first two or three years as an entrepreneur. The other challenge we have because of the oversupply capital and the just sheer energy on tech and entrepreneurship, we struggle across our portfolio with what we call false currencies. This notion that a young company should spend time on trying to get the founder on the cover of a magazine or spending time with celebrities. We think it's far more important for the founders to spend time developing their team, honing their craft, interacting with their customers, and putting themselves in a position to dominate. Um, But there's lots of shiny lights out there in the current environment, and there's lots of distractions, and these false currencies are, are one of the big challenges in Silicon Valley at the moment. So focus on fundamentals. And stay focused, I guess, is what I'm taking away. Uh, I have a few more questions before I'll open it up for the audience, but uh, I'm going to move just from entrepreneurs to investors and just give them a little time. So there are, I hope, folks here also who have um, ambitions of being successful investors, and you're both an entrepreneur and an investor. Could you share some of the elements you look for in an investor? Uh, And are there any attributes that, perhaps would surprise us about investors. Uh, we, we have a program we call Scouts at Sequoia. We created it about a dozen years ago. Um, 
it's meant to encourage our entrepreneurs in the current portfolio to, to think about angel investing. And uh, the Scout program is all about giving them the capital to begin to invest. And so the vast majority of people that have joined us at Sequoia were entrepreneurs that uh, Sequoia Capital has backed. Um, if you look at the group of partners uh, at the firm today, the vast majority were part of the portfolio. Not necessarily a founder, but probably on the senior management team or a key engineer. And making sure that the individual is going to enjoy investing and get comfortable with embracing risk is one of the key things we look for. Certainly ambition and intelligence and work ethic and cultural attributes, but the set of questions that you'll find us asking about risk might surprise you. Insecurity and a chip on your shoulder is rampant within Sequoia and it's something we look for in candidates. And I think every firm up and down Sand Hill Road has a slightly different approach, but I'm confident that the psychological makeup of the individual often determines their success. Thank you. You have spoken to me about the importance of mentors in your life, and, and Professor Manti is, has been one of those. Uh, and we've also talked about the importance of exposing our students to the right mentors. Uh, can you advise our students in particular about uh, mentorship and how important it is to them and what they should be looking for as they progress, not just through uh, their university education, but in life? Let me start with Dr. Manti. Hmm. Dr. Manti uh, taught a course sophomore year that I was exposed to, and I had some questions. I went and visited him during office hours. His door was open, 827 Rhodes. And Tom listened very carefully to my questions and quickly dispatched the questions in course. He then turned it around and asked me a series of questions. Questions that had depth. They were bespoke in nature. He had some understanding of my background and the ill-prepared nature <laughs> that I was uh, currently struggling with. And Tom was able to create an environment where there was trust, where there was vulnerability, where the kindness and energy and authenticity that he delivered allowed me as a young man to be vulnerable, to drop my defenses, to drop my insecurities, and move into a growth mindset. And that intimacy with a mentor, where you know that they're in your corner and you're capable of absorbing feedback in a thoughtful way from somebody that's got the domain expertise and value system aligned with yours. And I think that's a key element of the individuals you should look for as mentors in your career. And I often tell uh, my daughter's friends, more important at the company that you choose is the mentor you choose early in your career. And they are absolutely critical in your early arc. I think if you're not focused on mentors in your 20s, you're losing out on a massive opportunity. I think it's far more important than the company that you're at at that stage of your career. Thank you. I, I learned a great deal from that. And in fact, I focused the question on students, but I think the faculty in the room probably learned just as much about how they can be more effective in, in their responsibility to educating our students. So, so uh, thank you for that. Since we talked about Tom Manta, I'm wondering if you'd be comfortable sharing some of the details. I know we're going to announce uh, uh, your generous gift to the university later today, but uh, if you're not comfortable, that's fine. If you'd like to discuss it uh, right now, I think it'd be an opportune moment. Uh, I don't know if it's like the worst kept secret on campus or if people <laughs> genuinely don't know. There's a lot of suits up here in the front, so I know they're plugged in. Uh, I started some decade ago a scholarship program, Manti May, in the engineering school. I benefited from my pre-junior year on from a set of scholarships that allowed me 
to stop working while I'm here on campus. And um, it was an attempt to pay it forward. Tom has shepherded that program over the last 10 years. We've now had over 100 Manti May scholars graduate. And it's been an incredibly rewarding experience for me to watch Tom interact with this crop of students. Tom Manti, as I think about my mentors in my career, and I've had some extraordinary mentors in Silicon Valley, is my goat. He is absolutely the greatest of all time. And he's still alive, he's happy, he's finally married. He was a bachelor for 60 years. And I wanted to find a way to honor him. And so we are renaming the Graves Building across the way, the Manti Center. Dr. Pinto and I have teamed on a $25 million gift to try to embellish the co-op program and try to bring computer science or at least digital inclusion to the entire campus in a democratized way. Remove the intimidation of coding. All of us should have digital skills on campus. It ought to be a requirement right along with English. And it's an attempt to modernize our efforts across the entire campus and the engineering school. Perhaps the word transformational is overused, but uh, I can tell you that this is gonna impact the lives of countless students uh, for generations. And it's, we are very grateful for your generosity and for connecting back to your roots. Uh, this will enable us to fulfill a mission that uh, I would think will result, and I hope will result, I know actually will result in more stories like yours. So I think that's ultimately what we want. It's good for I, society. What I would say is uh, my honor and Luke 1248, which I realize you probably haven't figured out yet, but I know you will. <laughs> that's a lunch joke. <laughs> so uh, Anyway, we'll open our, it up for questions now. And uh, if you could identify yourself, be great, particularly the students, just tell us who you and are. let's stir the pot. It's been politically correct, the questions from the president. Everything is game. Let's get after it. <laughs> and just, uh, but identify yourself and tell us what program you're in. Well, I, I'm from. the executive director of the Entrepreneurship okay. uh, Center here. Well, so, right. uh, Jim, thank you so much for, for joining us today and, and for your amazing gift. Um, my question, and I will pass it over to others here, but um, as you have talked to many of the leading universities around the world, um, your Stanford talk is something that we refer our students to in terms of thinking it through uh, what investors are looking for in a pitch. What do you think are the driving things that those Stanfords out there are doing well in terms of cultivating their entrepreneurial ecosystem? Well, let me just say, um, and, and there's you know uh, another individual here, Tony Zingali, that we got to hand a mic to, but I, the first thing I would tell you is a graduate from the University of Cincinnati can compete at the highest levels. I told you about my high school GPA. I had an ambition to graduate at the top of my class here at Cincinnati. I did not. I graduated near the top of my class. But at Stanford, I was so well prepared from the co-op program and the incredible professors I had that along with a couple of others, I did graduate at the top of my class and realized that University of Cincinnati has real cred in the tech ecosystem and in entrepreneurship. And I know Tony Zingali, who's also in the room, would tell you he felt the same way. Tony's been a public company CEO three times in Silicon Valley, walked off this campus with a dual degree in both business and engineering, so he's in some ways a Linder alum, and joined Intel as a product marketing executive with GAME. When he walked into Intel, he understood what needed to be done, and the co-op and the experience here on campus is rare. I think co-op is our unfair advantage as a university, and I'm hoping we reinvigorate that effort and broaden it, but that would be my first comment. Uh, keep the chip on the shoulder that you're a Bearcat, but recognize that the Bearcat community that showed up in the Valley has done extraordinarily well. Thank you. Questions? Mike here? 
Anybody? Questions? Hey, Jim. Thanks for, uh, just want to thank you for coming out today. My name is Rob Manns. I'm actually the head of uh, Bearcat Ventures. It's a new venture capital organization on campus. You look like a venture capitalist. Do I? Do you kind of resemblance? <laughs> so what, the question I had is, over the past few years, we've seen the uh, increasing popularity of uh, student-led venture funds. Uh, for example, Stanford has their GSB Impact Fund. Uh, these funds co-invest in a syndicate alongside established investors who le lead the round. Um, what is your opinion on these types of funds, not as an investment vehicle, but as a learning platform uh, for students wanting to gain hands-on experience in venture? And do you think that experience translates well into the job market? I think the efforts across universities, including the University of Cincinnati in the area, is spectacular. It's a wonderful way to expose you to both the joy and challenges of investing. And it doesn't matter whether it's a million dollars or a thousand dollars. If you're passionately following that experience and teaming with that entrepreneur, it's going to begin to expose you to our industry in a way that we tried to emulate with scouts. You know, you talked a couple times now about Stanford. Stanford's benefiting from being in the middle of a massive tech ecosystem. And if you paid attention in the last couple years, you know, Miami is now claiming they're the new tech capital on the East Coast. And uh, I've got a second home in Miami that Tony has been to. I, I, I will just point out that I don't think on a given Monday there are more than two or three people coding in Miami. <laughs> and so creating a market leader with a lack of engineers is challenging. And so I think teaming as a business school with your colleagues across the way in engineering, as the dean had suggested, is one of the best ways to form an early team. And I'd also point out that the investment committee ought to have a similar complexion of diversity and inclusion from both schools. Uh, hello, I'm Jay. I'm a first year international student, uh, majoring An immigrant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Highly likely to start a company, in my opinion. <laughs> You. So I'm a take your mask off. Take some risk. <laughs> Let's take it all the way off. You know, we're with the president. I think you're good. Uh, so uh, I'm a first international student, uh, international majoring in astrophysics. Um, so my question to you is, uh, moving forward, uh, what, uh, what do you uh, um, what do you think? How quantum computers would affect the affect the way we conduct businesses, or uh, how quantum computers would affect our lives in general? Quantum computing. Mm -hmm. And you're in astrophysics. <laughs> yeah. Elon Musk is going to enjoy you. <laughs> Look, I think quantum computing is a massive opportunity, but it's in the phase that we call R at Sequoia. We think it's probably at least a decade away. Mm -hmm. And although we think it's important in fundamental research, and we certainly want to see large corporations and the NSF and academia fund the research, it's not an active area for Sequoia. We do have one team we backed out of Yale. Uh, Bill Korn, who uh, was the head of Bell Labs and later ran all of Google Engineering, we recruited into Sequoia some 12 years ago. Bill's passionate about this area and kind of brought it in as a science project and said, let's just do it. And so we do have a portfolio company in the quantum space, but I think the Conclusion for us at this point in time is still probably a decade away before we see meaningful commercial adoption. Um, I'm Alan Pasqua. I'm a fourth year marketing major. Uh, so that's actually what my question was about. A lot of what we talked about is ambition and risk taking, but uh, how do you balance that out with patience to really make sure that the opportunities you're pursuing are the right ones for you? It's a complex question. Not sure I can answer it. Uh, look, I think ambition and risk-seeking are a big part of your makeup if you're going to embrace entrepreneurship. Um, but it's lonely. And there are very dark days as an entrepreneur. And uh, as you look at these iconic individuals associated with many of the companies that have gone public recently in tech, I assure you there were years of sadness and self-doubt for each one of them. And so you have to have the courage to persevere. Now, there are times where it's just not going to work. 
And ideally in that environment, you have a group of people around you that are pointing out that it might be time to either go to the pay window, take an acquisition offer, or go home. And it's often related to market timing or competitive dynamics, but in our view, if you're not number one or number two in your market, I'm not sure it's worth your cycles or your team cycles. And so I think there's a need to be self-aware enough to walk away at some point in time and recognize there's no shame. In fact, we're more likely to back you the next time around. This looks like an athlete. <laughs> thanks, thanks. So my name is Jaden Walton, and I'm a second year in entrepreneurship. And I admire your ambition to start these companies and create interest. And as we're growing the entrepreneurship hub here at UC, what kind of advice can you give on growing our entrepreneurship hub and sparking interest to secure the foundation for this hub in the future? How many people are in the club? Um, it's actually very new. Like We just started the group chat, and I think it's about like 16 people we're adding. And soon coming up, I am trying to bring more people involved and communicate with the other schools here, like the law school, DAP, and everything else, to make those connections between the business and other schools. Well, I love the fact that it's exclusive, but I, I think uh, there are several people in this room you should be pushing for funding, because I'd love to see that program include hundreds of people across the university, ideally a thousand or more. I think the peer programs at some of the key schools on the West Coast, Berkeley or Stanford, are probably at least a thousand in terms of depth. Um, it becomes a bit more challenging in that environment because you have some tourists, some people that are interested in joining because in Tony Zingali's case, he would go to the library and it was a bit like a nightclub and he would use that as currency uh, while he was out there chatting people up. But I, I think trying to keep it focused on a group of people who are passionate about it and willing to give meaningful time to the activity, I encourage you to do that. At the same time, I think you're underfunded and you should push the president and his team for funding. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. <laughs> I knew you'd get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Shivanjali Ransi. I'm a second year PhD uh, student from Computer Science Department. Uh, so my question is that, like, how to believe our own idea. How can we prepare ourselves before showcasing our idea in front of investor? Because how can we believe like this idea will fetch a number of customers? And how can we convince the investor that yes, this will idea make a difference in the market? It's how it's different than the current status. There are a few resources that encourage you all to embrace if you're thinking about pitching a group of investors. There is a book called Crossing the Chasm written by Jeffrey Moore, High Tech Marketing. It's, I don't know, 30, 40 years old. It remains the Bible in tech. And although it's a bit dated, it's absolutely worth reading cover to cover. There is a new effort from a gentleman named Christopher Lockhead called Play Bigger. Christopher worked for Tony as the chief marketing officer at a couple of his companies. Christopher is bombastic, um, he's hard to kind of capture, but he's created some of the best work around category design and the work involved in creating a category. Most of the investment community today is very interested in category design because if you look at the last 100 IPOs, the most lucrative have been companies crafted with category design. And so, the energy around those two books and maybe spending some time in a program like Y Combinator can help you sharpen that initial value proposition, your domain expertise, your understanding of the market conditions. And ideally, you'd have a prototype at the time of the meeting. And I love that you've got a computer science background and you might want to team with some of these business people who have a acumen in and around marketing but the energy as an engineer that you should spend on distilling the value proposition and going through an exercise that Jeffrey Moore would call the positioning template. As an engineer, I thought I'd get it knocked out in a day or two. 
And for Vital Signs, it wound up taking me the better part of five months with the help of a whole bunch of marketing professionals to get to the point that we had a credible story to go pitch to Sequoia and Austin Ventures. So don't get discouraged. It's a difficult process. It takes time. It takes outside expertise. And if we've got marketing talent in the room, hopefully they'll find their way to you in the next hour. Thank you. Hi, my name is Victoria. I'm a senior at Lindner, and I've really enjoyed our conversations today because I actually just accepted a job in life sciences in California. Congratulations. So, um, and one of the things that I've thought about is potentially a career opportunity would be to go down into venture capital in the future. So I wanted to ask you if you had any advice for females in particular in this area for me to think about. Your timing is spectacular. Um, first of all, the venture capital community is dominated by white and Asian men. But that's changing. Some seven years ago, I battled some of my mentors to bring in the first female G GP, Jess Lee, to Sequoia. Um, now happy to say we have a handful of female investors. And we've been able to catalyze a movement up and down Sand Hill Road where the vast majority of new hires at this point in time are women. And it's a wonderful change to the dynamic in the partner meeting and around the investment decisions. And a big part of the catalyst for us was that we had passed on Snapchat. And we passed on Snapchat because as a group of men looking at the early days of Snapchat, there was, what do we call it, uh, sexting going on. And like many of the early internet companies, there's some level of adult. And we were well aware of that with Yahoo and Google and AdMob. But we couldn't get comfortable as a group of men backing a company that had some small percentage of the activity be sexting. And we passed. I believe Snapchat's probably a $30 billion company today. And we had a clean shot at both the seed and Series A. So it's one of those sins of omission that haunts us. But it was pretty clear that if we would have had a woman in the room, she would have reassured us that it's OK. And it happens from time to time. And we can work on driving the numbers down. And the failure to make the right decision as a partnership made it painfully clear that we lacked the diversity of thought in the room without women. And now that we have a handful in the room on a Monday making decisions, it's transformed our decision making and we believe it's a competitive advantage. Um, so I, there's no better time to join venture capital as a woman. And so come see me afterwards and I'll make sure I get some intros out for you. Thank you so much. Hi, Jim. My name is Ron Myers. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship here at Lindner. And here's one of my bright students. He mentioned that he's starting a venture capital club called the Bearcat Ventures. And um, this was all sort of driven by this guy. We, we're making our nascent entry into venture capital. Um, I'm building a course right now, now for venture capital. Um, but our first movement is going to be joining the VCIC. I'm sure you're familiar with the program, the Venture Capital Investment Competition. And um, some of the things that, that struck me about your marketplace is, um, I've heard this more than a few times, is that there's more investable capital than there are investable ideas. Is that true? And another question would be, um, the landscape for venture capital, um, how has it been affected by corporate VC? Is that, is that uh, interrupting your fundraising? Is that interrupting deal flow? Or is that a welcome addition um, on Sand Hill Road? Uh, there's certainly an oversupply capital in venture capital. There's no question about that. It's uh, created a massive expansion in multiples in the private market. The better funds are all closed. They've had LPs for decades. And the desire to access the asset class, if you can call it that. We don't think it's an asset class. Nonetheless, has created several hundred new firms in the last decade, or funds. The vast majority of those new funds will not return capital to their LPs. They exist on the fee income. So the typical venture fund is two and 20. 
2% for 10 years in fee and 20% profit share once you return capital. And so that term for profit share is carry in our industry. And the vast majority of folks that have new funds are driving BMWs and lording over young entrepreneurs and living off fee. Um, the concentration of returns sits with a small number of funds and firms who have an unfair advantage in access to the next wave of entrepreneurs and have worked hard to cultivate that ecosystem. I think at the university level, and certainly here in the Midwest, there's massive opportunity. And so I have a couple former partners who left us uh, some 15 years ago that started Drive Capital. Uh, I think based in Dayton and Columbus, but I know they've made investments here in Cincinnati. And you know their first fund, I think, will return seven to 10x and they have an ability to raise capital. So they are a large pool of capital focused on Ohio and I believe the tri-state area. And I think there are going to be other examples like it here locally. I think work from home in the pandemic has changed how young companies and families think about tech and where they work. And so we have a number of young companies in the portfolio who are looking to be remote first which I think creates an interesting opportunity for Ohio, where the cost of living is literally an order of magnitude less than what they might pay in San Francisco. And so we've seen a massive movement of talent outside of the valley to places like Nashville, places like Durham. And I think that will continue. And I think Cincinnati could become a magnet, especially with the university's help, for some of that talent. And in the process, could create a flourishing environment for Bearcat Ventures. We have time perhaps for one more question. Exactly, before we... thank you. One more question. My name's Maria Kiley. I'm a fourth year studying marketing here at Lender. Um, marketing. Yes, so if you wanna uh, I'm looking over at the computer science. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned a few times the psychological mind state that is necessary for um, entrepreneurs as they're struggling in their early years. Do you think this is something that can be taught or learned? And if so, what do you recommend for developing that skill? It certainly can be learned. I mean, one of the efforts that we put into developing our young partners is to build an artisan's approach to teaming and creating intimacy with an entrepreneur. You need people in your life that are gonna help you through those dark moments. And as an entrepreneur, uh, they go on for, at times, years. And having a group of mentors and colleagues and a handful of people in the company that you can share with is a big part of the kind of therapy that would allow you to get through that period. Um, your board of directors, if you decide to build one, is often a place to go when you're in trouble. One of our goals as a firm is to be the first call in a crisis. We're happy to have you call your mom when it's time to do some parade jumping and celebrate, but when there's a crisis or you're in trouble, we want you to call us. And so I think identifying investors and mentors that are gonna help you through that period is a key element of your foundation for the company. I think you're ready. I just don't think we can thank them enough are all of the team that helped bring this together. But I, I just want to make sure everybody heard loud and clear. One, UC has cred, but two, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley. I mean, I think it's a powerful engine, but you can feel us starting to rev. So I think we need to take this energy and these insights and really roll up our sleeves and work together to make this happen. More here. We have so much to learn, but I think so much potential. So thank you for this opportunity. I'll turn it over to you for final words. Well, Sorry. Thank you, Marianne. I do have one question I think that we haven't addressed in this game at lunchtime when you were talking about talent and the dearth of uh, diverse talent and the question came up with women earlier, but you talked about African-Americans mm -hmm. and the opportunity we're missing with respect to talent because they're not engaged. Uh, in or they're not, they don't have the opportunities, I should say, in, in Silicon Valley, specifically. Uh, to the professors and administrators here more than anyone else, uh, could you sort of 
repeat what you had said to me in terms of the dearth and the, so that we can understand what the challenge is for us and you know why it's so important strategically important for for our nation at lunch we were talking about diversity and, and specifically the black community here in ohio and tony and i grew up in, in cleveland and maybe 20 25 percent of my teammates um at, at different points of time were minorities and in the valley, we have a tiny community, maybe one to one and a half percent of the entire population. We're desperate to change that. There's enormous energy from tech companies and from the venture community to try to recruit from the black ecosystem and to encourage them to consider tech as a career path. Uh, we haven't made enough progress. I think the movement around gender is a decade ahead. Um, some six months ago, we hired Isaiah Boone at Sequoia. He's our first African-American partner, and we're thrilled to have him. And we didn't hire him because he was African-American. We hired him because he has game, and he's risk-seeking. And we think he'll be one of our partners in a few years. But we need more Isaiahs to come west and to take a risk with us and to help build a community. And when I think about black community and music and sports, I miss it. And a lot of us miss it. And we're hoping that we can bring more energy in that community and, and candidly others and have them take advantage of the enormous shift that's happening in tech and the wealth creation that's associated with it. As a uh, young black man, I think you can think about music and professional sports being their primary North Star when they think about rising up. We want tech to be sung by Kanye West and Kendrick Lamar and be part of the community as they think about where they might spend their time as young adults. Thank you so much, Jim. And with that, I want to thank you for spending time with us. I know everyone in this, uh, in this room has truly appreciated uh, uh, you are you sharing your experiences and again thank you for connecting with the university of cincinnati uh your educational roots uh, appreciate it and looking forward to the rest of your day here great honored and uh, i'll stick around for a few minutes if uh, you want to connect one-on-one -on -one or privately